everybody, and welcome back to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today we have something kind of different, um, but really kind of exciting as well. We have a panel of uh, folks from IBM Cloud um, that's going to be moderated by Cy Veneman, and we're going to talk about building with OpenShift and a lot of other topics on IBM Cloud. Um, and a lot of these folks who are on this um, panel are from a lot of the different upstream projects as well. So we're going to touch on some of that in the panel as well. So um, I'm going to let Sai introduce himself and then everybody else do it. And then we are just going to ask them a lot of questions. And if you have some, ask in the chat and we will relay them to the panelists. And this is indeed live. So Sai, take it away. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Diane. Hello, everyone. You guys are in for a treat today. Uh, my name is Sai Venom, and I'm a technical offering manager uh, with IBM Cloud. I've had the pleasure of working fairly closely with all of our panelists today. And believe me, again, you're, you're in for a treat. Um, these are folks who are extremely you know, motivated, engaged, and talented in, in their respective fields within IBM. And I want to take a minute here to just quickly touch on each one of them and have them introduce themselves. Um, so if you if you don't mind, please introduce yourself with your name, your title, and then what technologies that you focus on, and then anything else you'd like to add. Just maybe keep it to about 30 seconds to a minute each. Um, Chris, we'll start with you. Hey, sure. Thanks, Sai. Glad to be here. My name is Chris Rosen. I'm Program Director of Offering Management, responsible for kind of all things containers and microservices related in IBM Cloud specifically focused today on Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, next, we'll go to Doug, Doug Davis. Hey, thanks, Sai. Um, my name is Doug Davis. I uh, work for IBM, obviously, technical offering manager for Knative. So obviously, the technology of choice for me these days is Knative. And I'm actually involved in uh, delivering Knative in uh, multiple different projects within IBM Cloud. So we'll talk a little bit about that later, hopefully. All right, next up, let's uh, go to Peter. Thanks, Sai. So I'm Peter Clank. I'm the offering manager for our DevOps tool in the IBM Cloud. Um, so that's, you know, involves also uh, reaching out to a lot of open source communities and some of the upcoming technologies like Tekton uh, and how we can deliver that, you know, really effectively through OpenShift, through the public cloud, as a service, as a uh, role your own. And so that's uh, my area. It's a fun time. Great, great. Josh, to you. Hey there, folks. My name is Josh Mintz. I'm an offering manager for a whole cadre of databases in the IBM Cloud, like Postgres, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, uh, and Cloudant. Not many people are throwing in fun facts, so I'll, I'll add one. Uh, big soccer fan, love to watch Chelsea. So if anyone's a Manchester United fan, we can we can talk after the panel and have some words. And Josh, I think you also win for the most comfortable looking chair. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a throne, if you will. Great. <laughs> and finally, we've got Ram Venom. Hi, Sai. Um, I'm one of the technical offering managers on the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service and the Red Hat OpenShift um, service. Um, my focus is on service mesh, so um, I work closely with our Istio open source team um, and also um, service mesh on Red Hat OpenShift as well. And if you guys are noticing that there's a resemblance, that's because Fram is actually my brother. So I'll be sure to throw him all of my really difficult questions today. <laughs> Thanks, I now, expect nothing less. <laughs> now, a, a quote that I want to start with today uh, from IDC. By 2022, 90% of new applications will be cloud native and developed with agile methodologies and an API-based architecture that leverages microservices, containers, and serverless functions. Now, from the introductions today, I think we saw that we have a wide panel um, of panelists, and, and they, they kind of cover multiple key technologies. But at the root of it all, I truly believe is OpenShift, the container-based platform that powers cloud-native and container-based technologies. That's where I want to start. Chris, I want to start with you here. Why are microservices and container technologies seeing so much support in this current era of, of, of cloud native and application development? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of reasons really driving 
developers and organizations to embrace technology like cloud native and containers and OpenShift. And ultimately it comes down to three main use cases that we see time and time again. The first one is really around, you know, I'm building cloud native applications because we're all developing software in some form or fashion and we need to be able to do so quickly, but then more importantly, very securely. So I think for these net new projects, we're seeing a lot of gravitation toward cloud native microservices, containers, OpenShift. The second use case is really around the complexities that we live in with a multi-cloud hybrid cloud world. Customers that I talk to every day are running on-prem, IBM cloud, other clouds. So they need to be able to have that portability and that's exactly where containers and OpenShift come in to give them that common abstraction regardless of the, the IaaS that they're running on. And then the third one is around app modernization. Because again, the customers that we work with have a long heritage of existing applications. So how do we help them modernize that footprint into containers, cloud native type architectures? Great, so that's perfect. There's clearly a number of use cases for taking advantage of container and, and, and cloud native technologies. But at the root of it all, and the reason that we're gathered here today at the OpenShift Commons is OpenShift. So how do you see OpenShift as a solution to, to help address these, these use cases? I mean, obviously Red Hat, you know, long before IBM acquired Red Hat has put in a lot of effort working upstream in the community, just like IBM has as well. Um, but they've taken these open source technologies, which the reality is they're, they're hard. There's a lot of different projects. There's a lot of moving pieces. How do we make sure that you know, a new version of Kubernetes doesn't break something else or some other plugins or some other projects. And Red Hat is really focused on bringing and packaging all that you'll need to be able to run that containerized workload. So that's really where the importance and significance of OpenShift comes into play is because Red Hat has really hardened and secured and has a known uh, process to give those updates to developers and consumers. Then obviously fast forward, IBM acquires Red Hat and we've launched the Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud offering. To be able to provide that as a managed service to our customers, again, just raising the bar of responsibility. So our customers don't have to be experts in OpenShift per se. They're developing applications and running them that are solving their line of business objectives. And while we're on you, Chris, one last thing I wanna to touch on you know, you mentioned that Red Hat, even much before Red Hat uh, was acquired, they, they really focused on, you know, open source and contributions and working in this container space. Now, post acquisition, IBM has launched this OpenShift on IBM Cloud offering. Now, how is IBM, um, a company that's, that's fundamentally, you know, many ways the same as uh, Red Hat, but uh, also has been historically different. How has IBM kind of shaped itself and changed with the acquisition of Red Hat, how are we working with open source and, and how are we kind of making that apparent in our cloud? Yeah, so that's a great point. I mean, I think both companies continue to learn and grow and evolve from each other, which is gonna make IBM Red Hat combination honestly unstoppable going forward. That being said, we're really trying to harness the best from both of those cultures, both of those organizations, and from a broader IBM perspective, although we've always built on and contributed to open source, we're kind of learning the Red Hat way. And that's helping us accelerate those things, move faster, continue to build on those offerings. Because obviously we're all here because we love open source. The, the velocity that the community can move at is much faster than any single or handful of organizations can move. So we're gonna continue down that path, building out in the open, allowing that portability that way you know that's really why developers gravitated towards containers anyway was you know i could package up my app all of its dependencies and move that thing from here to there to anywhere consistently so we're going to keep doing that and bringing some important operational characteristics to those open source projects like the security the hardening the upgradability all the things that are really important to our customers once they deploy something how do you actually manage it and keep running it from day two onwards? Perfect, thank you for that. And you know, with, with this focus on open source and open technologies, 
Um, I want to move on to the next panelist here. Doug, your focus day to day, as you mentioned, is capabilities like Knative and serverless. And as we know, Knative is an open source project. It, it really grew in the open source community. Now, Doug, the first question I'll start off with here is where do you see you know, serverless or Knative, these technologies that you work with, fit in with the solutions that we just heard Chris talk about? Yeah, so it's interesting. Chris talked a little bit about uh, modernization of the app, right? And if you take that uh, at its face value in terms of what it actually means, well, it means containerizing your stuff, breaking up the monolith, stuff like that. Serverless is actually the next na na the next logical step in that progression, right? You take your model, you break it up into microservices, but then serverless goes one step further and says, okay, rather than just at a microservice level, what if you can actually break it down into individual functions? And, you know, that sounds cool from a technology perspective. You know, we're all geeks. We love that kind of a thing. But why are we doing that? Well, you're really doing it so you get finer grained resolution or, or deployment of your application, right? So you can scale one little slice of your application instead of, the entire thing, or even just a microservice level, right? So you get better resource utilization, you get all the cool features of serverless, like scaling down to zero, so it's, when it's not being used, it's not even running at all, so you get cost savings, right? So to me, serverless is the next natural extension for your, for your container as a service type of offerings, right? It's just breaking up things down to even small little bits for better resource utilization and scaling type stuff. So to me, it's, it's just the natural next step. And as you mentioned, you know, Knative is obviously right in the middle of all that, because depending on who you talk to, right, it's either, a hosting platform, kind of similar to Cloud Foundry a little, but a lot of people describe it as a serverless platform, right? And it's, it's specifically designed to handle the, the notion of taking your application, containerizing it, and running in a serverless type platform, but on our favorite infrastructure, meaning Kubernetes. Definitely, thank you. Now, for, for our users that are watching and, and when they hear serverless, many times they think about things like, you know, Lambda, maybe IBM Cloud Functions, these platforms that enable you to do code first, and then basically abstract away the requirements underneath. Now, those requirements underneath are kind of what we're focusing on today, that, that open shift layer, that container-based layer. Now, if we compare serverless of, you know, four or five years ago to serverless today, how has serverless evolved to adopt these new technologies? Yeah, so that's great. I, I think you're right. To a lot of people, serverless means things like give me your source code and I'll host it for you. And that's definitely true for, you know, depending on the platform. But you're right. Under the covers, they are all, for the most part, leveraging something like containerized technology. And so if you look at something like, um, like functions and uh, Knative, they are all using Knatives on the covers. They just hide it from you. Now, a lot of these platforms, like, for example, Knative, do actually allow you to see and deploy containers themselves or container images themselves. So they do actually allow you to, to work at that level. And what's really cool about that is it kind of reinforces this idea that the line between serverless or functions of service and containers of service is actually getting very, very blurry, right? Because if you look at the functionality in terms of give me your source code or run it for you or give me your container or run it for you, uh, auto scaling, toss in a little bit of scale to zero there's really not much of a difference anymore between containers of service, functions of service, and serverless. And I think what you're going to start seeing with platforms like Knative is that line becoming very, very blurry to the point where the user doesn't even have to think about, you know, what is the as I want to deploy this stuff onto, right? I just hand over my application, whether it's source code or an image, and the infrastructure just runs it for me. And then as a runtime, I just choose the configuration knobs I want, right? So I don't have to think anymore, well, do I want a PaaS versus FAS versus CAS? That, that choice is meaningless anymore, right? It's just what are the runtime characteristics you want? And I think that's the direction we're seeing with projects like Knative. And you can see IBM is really pushing that with some of the newer offerings that you can find on our platform. Okay, great, great. So one last thing I wanna key in on here on the serverless front. Now, OpenShift has kind of touted itself as Kubernetes for the enterprise. In fact, if you go to the Kubernetes documentation, you'll actually see verbiage around how Kubernetes was never actually meant to be a developer platform but it actually provides the building blocks for a developer platform. Now, I'd say, you know, and I think many people would agree that OpenShift has solved that problem for Kubernetes by creating, you know, abstractions, a dashboard, and experience for end users to more easily be able to deploy applications. They've, in essence, created a developer platform on top of Kubernetes. Now, what we're saying here and what you're kind of saying uh, is that I believe, you know, Knative is, is further abstracting that. Now, can, can you touch in a little bit of, of how exactly it's doing that, what the use cases are, and, and why we need to do that in the first place? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, even though everybody keeps talking about how, you know, Kubernetes has won the container war and stuff like that, and that, that's all true. Unfortunately, you have to kind of become an IT expert in order to use Kubernetes, right? Um, when, when the whole cloud computing thing came on board, everybody said, hey, this is great. We're going to abstract things away from you. You don't have to work with the VMs directly. And that's true, but now you have to understand how to do networking and all the other infrastructural pieces just to get stuff running in Kubernetes. And it's non-trivial. As great as it is, it's non-trivial. Well, Knative takes a step back and says, well, what if we can hide all that from, stuff from you, right? What if instead of you telling us all the various gazillion different configuration options that are out there, how you want those things set, how you wire them together, what if we take a different approach and say, just you know, give us your container image and what are the runtime characteristics you want to see, right? Do you want to see scale to zero, yes or no? Nope, I want to stop at maybe five instances because I need five running all the time, that kind of stuff. I don't have to worry about how the autoscaler makes that happen. I just say, give me five, right? And that's the kind of abstraction that people I think are looking for. They just want to say, here's my stuff, here are the runtime semantics I want to see from an external perspective, and Knative does all the magic under the covers, wires it all up together for you, all leveraging Kubernetes, but you don't have to worry about it anymore, and it just manages it all for you the way it should be, right? And you, right it's that abstraction that we keep talking about. Now, it's great you mentioned that uh, Kubernetes was never meant to be the platform for users to actually interact with. Well, Knative is almost the same thing, right? Now, while Knative's um, user interface is, is darn nice, I love it, it's really not meant to be used by the end users themselves directly, right? It's meant to be a platform for serverless platforms, right? And you can see Red Hat and IBM doing the same thing there. We're taking it in-house, offering it up to our customers, but wrappering it with some additional Red Hat IBM goodness around it to make it even easier to use so that you really don't even need to understand YAML in many cases, which is great, right? So you can see it popping up even more at, you know, at a higher level within our own platforms themselves. So that, that's kind of where we're headed with all this stuff. Perfect, thank you. Now, what we talked about a lot there was, you know, how Knative and OpenShift are making it easier for developers to work with the platform. But many times, you know, developers need automation. They need methodologies. If we go back to our quote, we said, you know, by 2022, 90% of new applications will be cloud native, dot, 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 developed with agile methodologies. So with that, I wanna move on to our next panelist here, Peter. I think, you know, can we talk a little bit to the agile methodologies that have been built to really support the technologies that that Chris and Doug covered, you know, being able to work with OpenShift, being able to work with Knative in a way that developers are better oriented with. Can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, sure. And I'm actually going to turn it around because I was thinking about this, and um, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the Agile Manifesto, believe it or not, uh, in February next year. And so, you know, the industry's been talking Agile for a long time, and I've been in the tool space that whole time, and. You know, I think what's been missing is that, you know, it's great to talk about faster velocity. It's great to talk about abstraction and isolation. It's great to talk about, you know, testing pieces in smaller chunks. But we didn't have the architectures, you know, 20 or 10 years ago to really support that. Not in a real way. You know, people were working with VMs. They were working with large Java monoliths, you know, packaged as a war. And, you know, what we've really seen now with the rise of containers is the arch and microservices is the architecture and the runtimes for that architecture that support an agile development. So, you know, once you have microservices, your code base is smaller. It's, you know, um, it requires a smaller team. So now you can start talking about two pizza teams that can collaborate more in real time. Um, that bounds the size of the problems you're solving in any particular microservice. So now, you know, the idea of very short iterations or sprints, you know, becomes a lot more doable because you're bounded. Um, refactoring, you know, in a way is a lot easier because you've invested in setting up the boundaries between those microservices and the APIs, and you've decoupled them, you know, to an extent. So uh, you want to change implementation languages. You want to change backend databases. You want to, um, you know, move from a very uh, rigid definition of how it's going to get deployed to more of a serverless approach where you're just talking, you know, in terms of uh, general scale and doing a lot of auto scaling and things. and you know, not being as prescriptive about how this thing is going to uh, appear in production. Um, and, you know, all of that's really reinforcing, you know, the, the agile way of working. Um, and so you see in the tools, 
you know, things like continuous integration have been part of Agile from the beginning and tools like Jenkins came up and, you know, everyone knew how to do a build in Jenkins and whatever. And, you know, I'd say what we saw in the last, you know, five years ago was, um, you know, the next generation tools were all about deployment and kind of geared to how do you deploy a monolith and, you know, schedule downtime windows and notifications and, um, a lot of manual processes and synchronizing with those manual processes that were running in other tools. And, you know, it's essentially, you know, how do you adopt a DevOps approach and really embrace Agile with an architecture and an implementation that aren't really geared to that and weren't really conceived with that in mind? Um, you know, what we're seeing now in tools, you know, is a little bit different. You know, the actual act of deployment, moving the bits into a cluster has gotten a lot easier. You build an image, put an image in the cluster. You declare it in a YAML file, you know, it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, right. And, and I want to but, touch on that a little bit here, Peter, and I might and I might actually pass this back to either, either Chris or Doug. Do you believe that, you know, kind of to Peter's point, that the, the platform and the orchestration layers, things like Kubernetes, OpenShift, were, were built from the ground up, knowing the way that users were going to be deploying on it? You know, the agile methodologies from, from, from one end to the other, you know, were they built with user, uh, users and agile methodologies in mind? I'd like to see Doug's input as well. From my perspective, I would say that most of the users that I talk to, they're not interacting with necessarily Kubernetes directly. They are, their integration point is from that CI CD tooling. They're pushing code, they're doing things, and then magic happens that they're not necessarily involved with. So I think from that perspective, yes, but the other side of it is, you know, like Doug talked about earlier, all the complexities of Kubernetes itself, and it's obviously a steep learning curve there. Yeah, it's interesting. I. I know I didn't think about it that way, but I, I, mm, I, if I had to guess, I'd actually say no, in the sense that I think most of what I think I see around things like Kubernetes and stuff is more around, hey, we've got the really cool technology containers. It has a whole bunch of benefits, better scaling, portability, all the stuff that Chris talked about. And I think they were trying to build tooling around that to make it easier to manage those things. And I think once people realize that you have this really cool deployment artifact called the container image that's that's portable and it contains everything you need you don't have to worry about all the install scripts that go around it it's all just sort of bundled up together i think it just naturally led into the entire devops story i don't think they necessarily had devops in mind when they did it i just think it's just such a natural fit for it that it just sort of happened organically but i could be wrong you know who knows what was running through these guys heads <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just want to add to that. I, I think you're right that I think it just everything just fits really well together. I don't know if it was an actual thought of you know whether whether they were thinking about one while they were building the other. The 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 declarative model of Kubernetes or OpenShift I think is what lends really well to this agile and continuous delivery um, like methodology. These individual development teams are able to declare exactly what they want, how the system should run, and they're able to do that in a in, a, in, in basically a static config and just apply that config. And the, the declarative model of these container platforms as well as the, the controller mechanism that runs in there that is turning things to equal what your desired um, configuration is just lends really well to that and it fits really well together. So, I mean, developers can just, you know, declare their config in, in some sort of um, source control, and then and then it, it, it turns into actual running artifacts. Definitely. E excellent discussion here. Uh, one thing I want to probe a little bit here is, you know, Ram, you mentioned that uh, the model of Kubernetes lends itself better as a declarative um, config approach. Now, Peter, kind of back to you here. We, we mentioned tools that have been around to support Agile and Agile workflows, you know, everything from what, how teams manage issues to how teams actually deploy code, maybe using something like Jenkins. But as we know today, there's always some cool new hot capability for doing DevOps. And it seems like every year a new capability is announced. Now, 
why do you think that is? And 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 can you speak a little bit to the to the tools in the OpenShift ecosystem and how they're enabling DevOps? Yeah, I mean, I think they keep coming up because you know developers uh, love developing tools for themselves. You know, I think there's a little bit of that, right? It's uh, it's the place where you see kind of innovation first. Um, I just want to, before I get into the tools themselves, I want to talk a little bit about you know how the nature has changed. So you know, just echoing what like Ram said. You know, I was describing tools five years ago as very procedural, you know, move this bit here, check this memory size, right? That's taken care of for you by the platform now. So the kinds of things people are automating are different, you know, and I think what you're seeing now is they're using the tools a lot more for automating, I almost want to say decision-making and judgment, you know, for what gets to production. So how can we, you know, essentially how can we mitigate risk earlier? You know, how can we do more automation around security scanning? How can we do more automation around integration testing? Um, and again, taking advantage of things like Kube and OpenShift, you know, the idea of spinning up new environments on which, you know, different kinds of very ad hoc probing, whether it's security or uh, performance or anything else, you know, becomes a lot easier and cheaper. So th people are now automating things that I think ideally, you know, if I were doing a marketing talk five years ago, I would have said, yes, you should automate, you know, all these things for your giant monolith Java application. But in reality, it wasn't happening. So, you know, still that need for automation, it's kind of shifted, you know, higher up the value chain as a lot of the details of bits have been taken over by the platform. Um, Tecton's the project we're really excited about at IBM and at Red Hat, and we were actually, both IBM and Red Hat were in before you know, we came together under one umbrella, because we really saw um, that the CI CD engine that we wanted didn't exist. Uh, there were some, you know, interesting commercial technologies. There were some, you know, Jenkins has kind of been sort of open, you know, previously under CloudBees control, now under the Continuous Delivery Foundation. But it's also a generation back from containers, and it's really not a, uh, you know, in its own architecture, not a container-centric uh, application, which makes it hard for, say, us as a public cloud vendor to scale it and manage it across multiple regions. It just wasn't built for that. Uh, it was very much a single tenant kind of on-prem design center. So, you know, taking these trends, you know, we want a cloud native technology for our implementation. We want to um, leverage containers in that implementation, but we also want to leverage that Kubernetes model of declarative definitions and um, use that for defining, you know, CI and CD pipelines. So Tekton brings those things together and, you um, you know, as someone was saying earlier, how you know Kubernetes itself isn't really wasn't start didn't start as a development platform. It started as a way you build a development platform. I think Tecton is kind of that same thing. It's a good set of primitives that I think you know abstract you know the notion of you're running steps in containers. Steps are organized into tasks that you know full control over the execution graph. Maybe things run in parallel. Maybe they're sequential. You have joins. You know, so arbitrary complexity of how you run this stuff. Um, but then you need to wrap an experience around it. You know, when when do different pipelines run? What triggers them? You know, often it's events in a Git repo that developers are initiating. Um, maybe there's some long running jobs that are going to go do some kind of soak test for 48 hours that eventually come back and, you know, trigger some the next step in your pipeline. You know, so all these things that have to get glued together. And I think that's what uh, the experience in IBM Cloud and our continuous delivery service and the experience uh, directly in OpenShift with OpenShift pipelines, you know, kind of do with Tecton is they take that core, you know, leverage its strengths uh, as being a cloud data solution itself, uh, and then, you know, put an experience around it that lets developers really just think, I'm going to commit my code, the right stuff is going to happen. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I want to build on that a little bit here. And we mentioned that, you know, Kubernetes was never meant to be a, a developer platform. But the wonderful thing about open source is that if there is a problem, someone out there is going to solve it. It's almost like a golden rule. Now, for Kubernetes, there are a lot of those problems. When, the, when Kubernetes was first announced, there was a lot of missing capabilities in Kubernetes. So what did the community do? They went ahead and started to solve it. Now, today, if we look at the CNCF, or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, there's over 1,400 open source projects under the CNCF. Now, if I were to span that outside to talk about any open source project in the Kubernetes ecosystem, I, I don't really even have a number for that. 
basically, there's a lot of open source projects out there to help you solve each individual problem that you might have. Now, the way I presented that makes it sound like a good thing. But for an enterprise, for a business, for a company who's trying to solve problems and just get something out the door, it's daunting. It's overwhelming. How do enterprises make the correct choice? So, Ram, I want to start with you here. Can you speak a little bit to the ecosystem of capabilities in the containers and OpenShift space? And then particularly maybe touch a little bit on, on how IBM and Red Hat can really help our customers, businesses, or just end users in general make the right decisions. Sure. Um, I think to, to build on that problem you, you were mentioning, um, each one of these open source projects tries to maintain a very sharp focus on the problem that it's, it's trying to solve. And, and the focus is usually pretty narrow, and that's a good thing, right? Like if Kubernetes focuses on just container orchestration, then it's like first class citizen would be containers. Um, it, it's a building block. I mean, Kubernetes is, is one portion of the entire solution, and, and it's expected that you would use a different block to solve a, a, a different set of problem. Um, so when cloud providers or uh, when cloud providers are trying to provide an end-to-end -end solution to their customers that is just trying to solve a business problem, which is you know, how to help developers um, deploy their applications faster, um, that solution needs to be more um, more end -to end consisting of blocks that that build closely together. And I think like that's where you would use a cloud provider because they have tested, they have they have they work closely with the communities of each one of these um, these these blocks, right? And and they build integrations and they build best practices that that fit really well together. And then they build abstractions on top. You know whether the abstraction could be as uh, as simple as like a CLI or, or a dashboard or integrations with other services like continuous integration, um, for example. And they're able to provide that as a solution. So um, that's really where you need to be. Um, looking at to consume uh, uh, the breadth of ecosystem and not get lost in each individual piece of it. Perfect. That, that's great. Now, Ram, I want to drill in a little bit into kind of what you do day in and day out um, at IBM, and that's helping our customers and users that need to manage all of these complex microservices, cloud native capabilities, you know, the services that are running in the cloud. Um, you know, thousands of microservices running across multiple data centers. How do these users manage all of these at scale? Yeah. Um, so what I do every day is help customers deal with um, microservices, right? They've broken apart monolith to microservices for all the various advantages. And, and as we all know, the big disadvantage of a microservice is the is the exponential growth of the network traffic and the focus on on the network layer. Um, so users now need to are concerned about getting control of this of this network layer again, and that's that's exactly what a service mesh um, uh, aims to solve. Um, users want to do uh, ex uh, enforce policies on which microservice is allowed to talk to which other microservice. They want to do encryption. Um, within their their environment. So these are all things that the service mesh allows you um, to gain control over. And so I work on um, Istio and service mesh on uh, on OpenShift. Uh, and these technologies are becoming really critical um, in not only for the control of the network layer, but also the the observability that is missing um, uh, w when you move to microservices. Perfect. And, and Ram, can you touch a little bit about uh, what OpenShift is doing with Istio in, in regards to OpenShift Service Mesh? Yeah, um, OpenShift Service Mesh is is based off of the Istio open source project. Um, just like you have said before, that you know OpenShift is like enterprise Kubernetes. Um, you can think of Red Hat OpenShift Service Mesh as enterprise Istio. So they've taken Istio. 
Um, and they built a set of abstractions uh, on top of it. Um, they have a set of best practices and some policies that are applied that um, that are good defaults, and it integrates well with existing um, op OpenShift resources. So it's it's part of just you know building that end-to-end -end, uh, solution. Perfect. Now we've talked about a lot of you know we started with the base you know the core of OpenShift and container-based platforms. We we spread out a little bit and we talked about agile methodologies and then services around that that layer. You know things like serverless. Um, and now we're, we're drilling into the ecosystem. Now, without a doubt, data and databases are a core part of this ecosystem. Now, Josh, this is a question kind of geared towards you. With OpenShift and container-based applications in general, stateless applications are, are becoming the norm. And in, in fact, you know, even before container container-based applications were really taking off, with the 12-factor app becoming popularized. Stateless apps were the way to move forward in working with cloud native applications. And that means people needed more data and they needed this data to be replicated and, and to be highly available and, and generally stored outside of local execution environments. So Josh, how does, how does OpenShift and maybe even cloud platforms, maybe specifically IBM Cloud, help users tackle this new and, and revitalized need for data? Yeah, for sure. So OpenShift and Kubernetes um, just generally really crushing doing stateless applications. Uh, in terms of stateful workloads, I, I think there's room for improvement that the community is is putting into the, the newer versions, um, especially stateful workloads in regards to the database space. Um, over the last few years, as databases moved to the cloud, um, there's been a lot more complication um, developing databases for the database developer like IBM Cloud and or the Postgres community and the fact that now everything is a distributed system. Once you put it in the cloud, it's distributed. It's away from your laptop. It's away from a server that you can access in your data center. And a, as part of that, especially when we talk about relational databases, um, you're introducing more complexity just by the nature of having a distributed system. Muxing that together with something like Kubernetes, which is really good at turning things off and turning things back on again, uh, is a really good way to lose data when you're running a database. So um, I, I think that for the most part, when I talk to customers, there they're, they're are two camps right now for those that are running OpenShift and Kubernetes workloads. Um, one is the, the net new cloud native application that wants to use a, a cloud native database um, one that has geographical replication and distribu distribution, um, sort of the, the new SQL uh, group of databases. You might be familiar with like CockroachDB or, or MemSQL. Uh, they would either run it themselves uh, in OpenShift with uh, the advent of Kubernetes operators and OpenShift operators. It, it's become tremendously more possible to run databases at scale. In fact, our cloud database as a service products are actually built and run with Kubernetes operators, and we run more than 20,000 databases worldwide. Um, so it, take that as a data point for operators are really, really useful for databases. Um, they solve a lot of the harder problems, but um, I think there's a few more years to get it to you know, easy adoption at scale um, in terms of running databases yourself on Kubernetes. Because on the other hand, I, I'm also you know, in the Apache Couch DB community, and uh, a lot of people are, are having problems running um, databases on Docker and databases on Kubernetes. That's why we released the Apache Couch DB operator, um, but they're, they're losing performance, they're losing data. Tracking back to my original point though, um, there, there's two options for users. There's run a database yourself in OpenShift or a, adopt a, a managed service from a cloud provider, or at least these are the two options I've discussed the most with customers. Um, some customers want to be hands-on. They have the operations team and the experience to run a database. By all means, um, would always recommend to use a, a Kubernetes operator provided by the vendor or a, a trusted open source committer um, because there's there's operators that don't come directly from a vendor or a vendor doesn't exist for a project because it's in the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation. Um, so definitely do your due diligence there, um, especially as you move higher up the stack and levels of operators. You're going to want to make sure that, you know, the people that are 
adding automation and self-healing to the database are the, the people you probably want to be trusting with that level of addition to a database. Um, Cause there's all sorts of ways databases will fail um, and they will fail. Um, so you definitely want to, you know, go with the subject matter expert in that space. And the other option is to use a managed database from any of the major cloud vendors and OpenShift and Kubernetes make that quite easy to like find an application to an external database. Um, so it really depends on your comfort and skill level running a, a database and whether um, you are okay with handing off the, the management, automation, scaling, security, and compliance of the database to a cloud vendor so you can spend more time, uh, you know, working and building OpenShift applications um, with your team. So I'll pause there. I know I, I covered a lot of ground, but um, in terms of data being the core, I, I find that when customers are successful with, with data, it makes it a, a lot easier to move faster um, developing the, the stateless apps and the OpenShift applications they're building. They just knock that one out, make sure it's stable, and they can spend more time doing the things that provides them the most business value rather than trying to do like schema design or high availability of the database. Excellent. Excellent. And, and you know, I think we've seen a recurring theme today of putting gearing up um, open source capabilities that, you know, of course, anyone can run them, they're free, but the overwhelming thing that we've seen here is that you're going to need to manage it yourself. You're going to need an operations team to do it. And I think that's what uh, you kind of walk through there with using operators to run databases yourself versus just going with a managed service. You know, if we take this discussion back to what Doug initially talked about, you know, yes, you can move forward with open source Knative, but you're probably better off taking advantage of a platform the same thing goes for service meshing and Istio and service mesh. Um, and, and Peter, uh, with, with the, the DevOps tools you kind of explained as well, such as Tecton, you can go with the open source capability. Um, so I, I want to kind of open this up right now for either, you know, any of you to kind of chime in here and talk about a little bit about how for the space that you're focused in on, whether it's DevOps, serverless, Istio, when does it make sense and what are the key things that a, a user needs to look for to decide should I go for the open source solution or should I go for the, the cloud vendor provided opinionated platform? I mean, so in the DevOps tool space, I mean, I think we have this conversation a lot and I think it's historically something people, you know, are used to running in house themselves and, uh, you know, often um, not, you know, often there's a central team managing it. Uh, sometimes there's not. Um, it consumes resources and you know is is there really differentiation enough in the tools from you running it versus using a cloud service where you don't have to think about it and i think you know especially when we're looking at open source projects like tecton and, and all the others it's the same thing if you know something very bad happened in the world and you needed to run it yourself you have the open source you can do that but day to day why are you choosing to put your effort there, you know, instead of in the applications you're building and the business domain that you work in? Let us run it. We run it, you know, across the cloud, across many regions and data centers. And, you know, we've we've gotten good at it. And I think, you know, that's kind of the generic th argument you make for, you know, cloud platforms in general is let you specialize on what matters. Um, last thought on DevOps is, you know, I think that's the tool piece. Now, I think you know, we're at a place where people still will write their own CI and CD pipelines and processes to run on top of that tool. I predict we're heading in a direction where more and more of those pipelines themselves will be standardized. So not just the tool, but the logic of what are you doing? What kinds of quality and security metrics are important to test for that everyone should just be doing? Um, and, you know, something we're trying to do on top of Tecton is build that reusable set of assets for, um, you know, here are the kinds of things you need to think about if you want to um, meet SOC 2 compliance or uh, HIPAA or FedRAMP or any kinds of these standards that uh, we as a cloud provider need to meet. Most of our, you know, clients that we work with need to meet as well. So, you know, sharing um, more knowledge a little higher up the stack. Definitely. And, and, and with that, I want to maybe take it a little bit closer to the stack. Uh, OpenShift itself, you know, I think Chris, you mentioned in the beginning that with the acquisition of Red Hat and then uh, kind of the onset of our focus on OpenShift, we announced OpenShift on IBM Cloud. Um, as we know, OpenShift is based on the open source platform origin Kubernetes distribution or OKD. 
Chris, can you talk a little bit to you know when a user needs to consider open source versus open shift versus you know the third flavor, which is managed open shift? Um, I'll, I'll let you take that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to jump in. I, I definitely agree with a lot that Peter said because we run into this where you know OKB is free. I can go out there and I can play with it. And so when we have these discussions, it's not to imply that you or your organization is not technically competent to deploy and run OKD as a platform. But similar to what Peter said, we think you should focus higher to, to things that are solving your line of business objectives, not running OKD. And as a part of the managed service, specifically with Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud, you'll get the 99.99% SLA, the HA masters, multi-zone clusters, bare metal worker nodes, um, you know, all of the compliance that Peter mentioned. So that's the value of the managed service. Ultimately, you're still gonna build containerized workloads and run cloud native apps, but it's really about, you know, SLA, the availability, the redundancy built into the offering and allows you to focus on your objectives. Perfect, perfect. Now, uh, one, one more quote that I wanna use from IDC here, and while we're on you, Chris, um, I wanna shift gears a little bit here. And, and this quote here says, you know, by 2024, over 50% of user interface interactions will use AI-enabled computer vision, speech, natural language processing, and either AR or VR. So these are high-level services that are being offered by cloud platforms Especially, you know, the key, uh, the key thing here, IBM Watson and, I, and the Watson services available on IBM Cloud. Um, Chris, can you touch a little bit about how these higher value services can be consumed from the cloud native platforms that we've been talking about today? I, I truly believe that responsibility lies on, you know, as IBM Cloud, as the vendor to make these easily consumable so that end users don't have to have, you know, a PhD in data science to be able to effectively take advantage of these, um, these technologies that are available. Right, so I think you touch on, um, there's a lot of different aspects of kind of adding these higher value services to your apps. And, and obviously we think that consuming those easily and securely is of utmost importance, right? So obviously as I'm building my app, I wanna add that cognitive capability so whether I'm adding, like you said, voice to text, or I'm doing a chat bot, or I'm doing some other, adding more intelligence to my app, we wanna be able to do that. So that's obviously very important. You can easily deploy a Watson service, and there are a number of different cognitive capabilities that you could then leverage within your containerized workloads. But another area that I think is probably more important is really around data access, data controls, using that cognitive capability in the right way. Um, and, and hopefully you've seen some of these announcements recently around, you know, with all the things that are happening in the world that we live in today, uh, that, that IBM has basically announced that we're not gonna use that AI technology for, you know, some of the racial profiling and things like that, that um, maybe is, or is definitely not the right use of that technology. So um, I think, you know, there's one hand of using the technology, using it the right way, and that IBM is kind of a steward of the community and really advocating that we do use that technology in a way that is beneficial to the broader society as a whole. Not just, you know, we're selling technology and widgets, you know, that's obviously important too, but, you know, IBM as a corporation is really focused on the societal aspects of our technology as well. Excellent, excellent answer there. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I can kind of think of off the top of my head is the, the call for code initiative that IBM has launched and the focus on using IBM cloud technologies to potentially solve, you know, uh, COVID related or pandemic related issues that, that we're all facing today. Um, I'll pause here for a second and see if anyone else wants to chime in on the, the use of AI and higher value services from the perspective of um, uh, cloud native platforms. Um, so the, as you mentioned, this user interaction layer is, is changing, right? The, the traditional, um, here's my, my web server that can serve, you know, thousands of requests, uh, 
by itself and is able to serve like static content in a, in a synchronous manner, like that, that doesn't cut it anymore. Um, so to take advantage of AI and, and, and all these other cognitive capabilities when you write your user interface, you have to write that layer a little bit differently. So um, we mentioned, you know, leveraging existing APIs to build this layer. So you're calling external services like the Watson APIs, uh, but you're having to rely on all these various APIs on, on every request. There, it requires more um, processing power on every request. It requires more data analysis on every request. And in many cases, these user experience are expected to be a step ahead of the user. Um, and give the user what they want before before they actually have to like go around finding that necessary uh, information. So there's a lot of like predictive analysis that needs to be kind of built into these the good user experience layer. What where I'm getting at is that all of these requirements put a different set of um, needs on the, on that application layer. These applications end up being very network intensive, very resource intensive, and they need to be able to quickly scale. Um, up and down. So containers and the virtualization layer that the container platform provide, I think, allows you to build these layers in a much more effective, effective way. They give you that control of being able to, you know, scale up and down as your as your requests from your users go up and down, and take full advantage of the underlying um, infrastructure that your container platform. Uh, is built on and leveraging. Masai, I just wanted to circle back around to something you were talking about earlier about you know when to choose open source versus something offered by a platform and stuff like that. And I just want to sort of dovetail on what Chris was saying there, because my initial answer to your question was, or if you focus on the basic question, right, open source versus offering from a from a provider. Uh, to me, I would look at it as I would look at the open source technology. I would look at the open source technology first, just to see if the base functionality is something that looks like it's going to solve your needs, and you know, use that, play with it. Obviously, it's free; it's low cost. You can install it, play with it, have your devs go have some fun with it, right? But at, that, at some point, then you get into what Chris was talking about. It says, "Okay, great. This technology at a base level suits my needs. Do I now want to manage this myself going forward?" And that's when you start looking at, okay, what, how much time do you want to invest in managing it versus having developers work on your business logic and your actual stuff that makes you money, right? And that's when you can decide, okay, nope, I, I need to manage this myself versus no, I want to be on a platform which just allows me to install it versus a platform that will install it for me and manage it or go one step further and do what you're seeing on other platforms where it's like it's as a service, right, where you just – deploy your application and everything's hidden from you, right? So you got a whole breadth of things to choose from. And this goes directly to what Wolfgang asked in the chat here, right? He, for whatever reason, has a real trust problem with uh, managed services. Okay, fine. But he, he could still leverage the open source technology at, at, a, at a layer where he can manage it himself, but someone else is perfectly okay with IBM Red Hat managing it for him. But the point is if they can stick with the core open source technology, then they get the freedom to move around if they need to, right? They get the same core technology, different providers, different levels of managedness, if you want to call it that. But they don't have to necessarily swap out everything just because they're going to switch from one provider to another, right? The core technology should be the same wherever they go. So they get that interoperability, portability aspect, but still have the level of choice and how much they want to manage themselves. Anyway, just Excellent. And I think I think that's a great point that you made on, on how users are able to maybe start with open source, investigate, and then choose to go with the managed approach. You know, going with the managed approach doesn't mean you're going with an entirely new platform. It's not like the platforms have forked and going off in completely different directions. Uh, for, for a platform like IBM Cloud, you know, we, we work in the open source. So although we have our managed offering, Whenever there's key changes or customer requirements or, or that kind of thing that force us to create new features, this is the same thing for Red Hat, the same thing for any company working in open source with managed offerings. Those changes are then contributed back into the community. So I'd like to quickly touch on what IBM has been doing in the community uh, and specifically what we've been doing around things like Helm operators and the operator hub and, 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 and these key open source capabilities that we're taking our expertise and know-how and then contributing back to. So um, if, if, if we can touch on that a little bit, I'll, I'll open that up to the panel for, for anyone to chime in. I mean, Jack, I can talk a little bit. Of, okay. Oh, Chris, you go first, and then I'll talk about databases. 
Sure. So, so there is an IBM Cloud Operator that you can get on OperatorHub.io. Uh, so we're obviously excited about that to be able to run some of the fundamental commands and things within the platform. There are also a lot of different teams contributing, and Josh will dig into that from the database side and what they're doing. Um, but you know, we are completely aligned with Red Hat's strategy around operators and adopting that methodology to simplify deploying our content. And one of the things that got announced at Red Hat Summit earlier this year was the, the Red Hat Marketplace. And basically, it's IBM and Red Hat, our ISV ecosystem. In, in OpenShift 4.4, it brought the marketplace into Operator Hub. So now I deploy an OpenShift cluster, and I see all of that content. IBM provided, Red Hat provided, ISV ecosystem, and it allows me to quickly deploy that content, and again, just simplifies not only deployment, but then ongoing lifecycle management. So I just, again, moves my responsibilities up higher. Excellent. And uh, just a quick heads up, we've, we've got a couple more minutes here remaining. So Josh, I want to uh, let you answer your piece on, on the databases and open source front. Um, ideally, yeah, we can keep for it sure. Important. I'll keep it short. So uh, I was just checking out Operator Hub, and IBM has a, a whole host of new content on there, even since the last time I checked. Um, so we have the cloud operator, there's storage operators from Spectrum, and there's product-specific operators like for Kafka and streaming. Um, but event streams are for IBM Cloud Object Storage. On the database front, um, we've been really thrilled with the release and the reception of the Apache CouchDB operator um, that comes from IBM. Uh, CouchDB is really good at moving data around wherever you need it to be. Um, so one of the roadblocks that I see customers have with Kube is um, their applications are supposed to be portable, but data isn't portable. Uh, CouchDB helps folks solve that, and um, we, we've seen good uptake there. And over time, there's going to be a lot more investment from the IBM community, especially around data and operators. So look forward to that. Excellent. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you so much to all the panelists that have joined me here today, as well as the audience for tuning in. Uh, Diane, back to you. All right. Well, I... Um... I almost could say, I couldn't say any of this any better than you guys. It's wonderful to have you on today. Um, it's wonderful to see the enthusiasm for open source, for OpenShift, and all things Kubernetes um, at IBM. And it's been really um, a very interesting growing experience getting to have the extended community participation of IBM and the Red Hatters doing that. So it's um, really a, kind of an exponential growth in the number of people contributing to open source projects that we've been all working together. And so it's been great getting to know you. So thank you for taking the time today. Um, we definitely are going to get each one of you back on for a full hour long deep dive on these topics, because every one of them is something we want to hear more about. So thank you for taking the time today to introduce yourselves and being part of the OpenShift Commons. Um, really appreciate your participation.